Hey, WTFers. Today's sponsor is AdamandEve.com. Get 50% off any item along with free gifts and shipping when you enter WTF at the checkout. That's AdamandEve.com. AdamandEve.com. Have fun. Lock the gate! Are we doing this? Really? Wait for it. Are we doing this? Wait for it. How? What the fuck? WTF. And it's also, eh, what the fuck? What's wrong with me? It's time for WTF. What the fuck? With Mark Marin. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck, Nicks? How are you? It's me, Mark Marin. I am in London, England. I've not uh, done any podcasting from London, England until today, the day before I leave London, England. And I've got to be honest with you, I've had a pretty great time here. Well, I knew I would, but you know, I've been uh, a little awkward, a little adverse to traveling to the UK, to traveling to Ireland. I make myself a little crazy, but that's not really the issue. The issue is that I spent two weeks here and I didn't do a lot. I did a few things because I felt like I had to do them. I did shows every night at 10 at night. The run went really well. Uh, The audiences were much better than I thought. There were a lot of what the fuckers that came out, and I certainly appreciate you being here. Uh, I had a lot of good food. I was staying in Soho. It was terrific. I took a walk down by the river. I saw Parliament. I saw Buckingham Palace. I saw, you know, Big Ben. I did uh, did the Monument. I went to the East End, and I walked down uh, around there. I saw the Tower of London. I did a lot of stuff. I crammed it in i didn't get to a couple places i didn't get to the british museum i literally went stood in front of the british museum knowing what was in the british museum having been there once when i was uh, just out of high school and i just i don't know if i was depressed i don't know what happened but i just i got out of bed i've been sleeping really late here i don't know why i got out of bed i'm like i gotta go to the british museum fuck it you know i need to see you know, the Rosetta Stone. I need to see that crystal skull. I need to see some mummies. I need to see all the stuff that the British Empire has stolen from other people over the years and, 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 and stocked up into that British Museum. And I just stood there in front of that place. It was so big and so daunting. And I got exhausted and resentful. And I couldn't fucking deal. And I thought to myself, wait, do I have to see the Rosetta Stone? I mean, it was essential in figuring out how to interpret hieroglyphics. Just the fact that I remembered that means that the British Museum had done its had done what it needed to do. It unearthed a memory of something I learned in a history class, probably in ninth grade, and I felt satisfied. And I went and got a shave by a Cypriot instead. I got a shave down the street from the British Museum, and the guy smacked me in the face afterwards. It was like hostile, like he was he was jamming the brush into my face. It was not a good thing. And I didn't know what, why. He did a very good job, but I didn't know what, what I was supposed to do. Who hits a guy after a shave? Was it, and I didn't know if I should tip him, tip him more for that. But it was like a real a couple of smacks on my face. I got past it. The only weird thing that really happened here, to be honest with you, was uh, I'd done a pretty good show. I've been putting my heart out there and doing, the, and doing some pretty good work uh, about an hour, 15 minutes a night. Just me. And I'd done a pretty good show. And uh, I was leaving backstage and I was walking down the stairs and the audience was still, you know, letting itself out. I mean, they were all walking down the stairs and, you know, there's that moment where you're performing, you walk out, you lock eyes with someone who was in the audience. I see this woman looking at me. I'm looking at her. She's with a guy. She was actually with a friend of mine, Jerry Sadowitz. And she locks eyes with me. And there's that moment where you're anticipating something, You, you know, you're always sort of fishing for a compliment in your heart. You'd like some, some, uh, kudos, so, you know, like something, you'd like something nice to be said about what they just saw if they're going to lock eyes with you. And I don't know if this was British or what, but she just said, uh, y'all right. Are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? That's about the worst thing you can say to me after a show. Am I all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Why didn't you just not say anything? How would that have been? Why not just give me a dirty look? Was that, were you, was that being polite or didn't matter? They also say, like grown-ups say, they got to take a wee, like publicly, when they have to pee. They they literally say, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to have a wee. Oh, it's so cute. It's like they're seven. Here you, here they are in the, in just the, you know, what's left of, uh, you know, centuries of empire. Just people saying, I've got to take a wee. I'm going to have a wee. Really cute. I uh, was in the same space as a small opera production of La Boheme. 
an updated, very small version of that opera. So the set I was working with was, uh, it looked to be an apartment. It was a sort of an updated, modern version of La Boheme, and it literally looked like the apartment of a, a few of the girlfriends I had in college. Uh, there were paintings uh, strewn about, a guitar, a shitty couch. It looked like it folded out to a bed. There were pictures on the wall. It looked like a shitty artist's apartment. And throughout the run, I improvised in that space about having dated women who lived in those kind of places. And then I sort of condescended to painting, to saying, like, we all had this friend or this girlfriend, the painter. Who the fuck dedicates her life to painting? What a ridiculous dream that is. And I had some spite in my voice, and I'm actually feeling guilty about it today and i'll tell you why because i went to the tate modern museum which is spectacular it it is one of the best museums i've ever been in in my life and i think i needed to go and i i was actually not going to go to the tate museum because i'm like how much modern art can i see in one lifetime i've i've got this angry detachment from art because i had an experience where i'm like i don't know where how to integrate this shit anymore i don't i don't know if i'm going to learn where it belongs in the history of art or in the context of how it was created Uh, a lot of that stuff is starting to dissolve in my brain it's starting to dissipate i no longer have a context anymore because i'm getting older and i don't give a shit as much so i started to detach and then i realized i started to sound stupid and angry about what painting painting is supposed to be great it's supposed to take you to another place it's supposed to you know bring everything and together in in that moment on that canvas for you to take in and for it to sort of you know drop into the empty slots in your brain and blossom something art is supposed to punch you in the brain and it's supposed to stay punched that's what it's a good piece of art does it doesn't matter whether you understand it or not you need to be punched in the brain so I went in there, and I, it was breathtaking. And I don't have that experience very often. This museum is breathtaking. It used to be some sort of power plant, and the bottom floor is where they kept the turbines. So it's this amazingly huge space. And I just, I mean, just the structure itself blew me away. And here I was walking through, through exhibits of artists that I've seen before, but having a, a completely different experience because of the way they were presented at this, at this museum. Like whole rooms of Gerhard Richter. I mean, Gerhard Richter is probably one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. And you're just standing in a room with these massive, almost 10 foot tall abstracts, like six of them punching in the brain from all, all angles. A whole room of Cy Twombly, just beautiful, big red, pink brushstrokes, just smacking your face around, just smacking your brain around. Wake up, man. Look at this. This is fucking poetry. This only happens here on this canvas. This will never happen again anywhere else. You are standing in front of the final piece, and it is done, and it is here. Reckon with it, fuckface. That's what that was saying to me. And I'm like a guy that wanted to be an artist. You know, I wrote poems. I did photography. I took a lot of pictures. I thought about it. I didn't do it. There's no reason for me to resent it. It's such an enriching thing. And even if I don't understand where anything goes or what anything does, I, I was in an Andy Warhol room, and even Warhol, as, as tired as that guy may get, I love some of his shit. And they, they displayed it beautifully. And then I started thinking, like, what the fuck did I do? What did I do? What did I do with my life? Oh, by the way, I also had a pork belly and applesauce sandwich at Borough Market that was spectacular. Do I use that word too much? It was awesome. I haven't been eating that much meat, been trying to be good, but that today was the day. Today was the day for paintings and pork belly. Today was the day. But what did I do with my life? Am I an artist? I mean, I have a hard time calling myself that. I don't know if comics are artists. I know that sometimes it's everything is happening in a very immediate sense, that what's going on on stage will never happen again, that that experience between me and the audience will never happen again. It's not on tape either. It is in a moment. It will never happen again. A woman stood up in a show at the, at the Soho Theater here after I did three Jesus jokes and said, that's it, I've had enough. I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I'm leaving. Why the advertisement? Why do we have to billboard the faith? Do you think someone else is going to get up and go, oh, if she's going, I'm going too because I'd like to be a Jehovah's Witness? But there are, there are moments that happen on stage. I don't know if what I do is art because I don't know how consistent I really am with it. Is a well-crafted joke art? Is comedy really art? It doesn't seem to really hold up for the long haul. It doesn't seem to hold up historically. Maybe some plays do, but does stand-up hold up? Do people really go back and look at prior as something timeless? Do we do timeless Is that what we do? I don't think we do timeless. I think we do timely. 
On this show, we're going to talk to a British comedian, Stuart Lee, who I had to be introduced to. This is the weird thing about British comedy and American comedy. This guy is a great comic. He's an inspired comic. He's a truly unique comic. And, and if anybody that I've seen lately can, that I think might be you know, someone I would call an artist, it, it would be this guy. And I'm not even sure why. I... He's been doing it as long as I have, if not longer. And the business here is so much different than the business is in America. And I had no idea who he was. So I had to do sort of a cram course on him and, and, and then have an interview with him. But he's a, he's a very unique comedian. There's very rarely that you see people who are truly unique. And Stuart Lee is truly unique. And I felt like an idiot because I don't know much about British comedy. I, I'm embarrassed about that. Maybe I need, but I don't know much about American comedy either. I don't know much about comedy that, that, you know, beyond my garage, to be honest with you. Okay, what the fuckers? I know that some of you are a little uptight. I know some of you are pretty proper. I, I run in two worlds. But look, our sponsor is Adam and Eve, and that's just the way it goes. That AdamandEve.com, if you go there, look, you can get 50% off any item along with free gifts, free shipping when you enter WTF at the checkout. All right, that's at AdamandEve.com. And what they have at AdamandEve.com is grown up stuff, dirty movies. Oh, no, let's not say dirty. Let's say adult. I like them. I got a few. Uh, toys. Plenty of toys. And, and I want to reach out to the women, if I can, without insulting uh, any of you, is that I've said this before. I, I've never dated a woman that didn't have a toy. And uh, you know what kind of toy I'm talking about. So if you need a new one, they got them. They got all kinds. Go to adamandeve.com. You can put WTF uh, in the window at checkout. And you get free shipping, get 50% off any item, and you get some free gifts, some grown-up movies. So enjoy that. Don't be afraid to buy a new toy. They come in all colors and shapes. Some of them require batteries. Some of them don't. Some of them strap on. Some of them, I think they have one that actually straps onto your chin. That's silly. But, you know, it, maybe it'll look silly, but maybe it'll feel good. That is the obstacle we have to cross here. AdamandEve.com. Uh, in my uh, temporary uh, housing here in uh, London, uh, uh, Stuart Lee, uh, uh, I don't want to say a living legend because I don't like being called that, but uh, certainly a great, unique comedian is here. How are you, Stuart? Fine. Thanks for having us. I saw you in Edinburgh yeah. in 2007. Oh, in 2007. Yeah, yeah, right. Because people took me to see you. They yeah. said, you got to see this guy. I was a miserable wreck of a person when yeah. I was there. I, I had a miserable time. But I was so stuck in my own shit. And, yeah. you know, and I had never been to the festival. But, yeah. but y your pacing and your, uh, and your delivery had a, had, a, had a profound effect. But then it just sort of, I didn't, I didn't look you up again. Yeah, fine. I went to the United <laughs> States. <laughs> well, no, no. This is the thing, though. And then yeah. people, you know, uh, were telling me like this, you know, you got to see this guy. You guys have things in common. Yeah. And I got to say, I was nervous when you were coming up here because I spent a lot of time watching your stuff and you're a singular voice. You know, no, one is, of you. no one is like you. Well, it's just I've copied people that you don't know about. Is that what happened? Okay, yeah, well, yeah. now that it's explained. <laughs> but uh, well, it seems to me that your stand-up, you know, and when I watch it, has a very, and not only is it deliberate, but like there's a timing to the sound that you have a, a very specific pace that you're willing to wait. Yeah, well, I do like that. And, I, and But, you know, when I was a teenager... Uh, I was I was lucky or unfortunate, depending on you know which way you view it. In that, of the first ten stand-ups I saw, by just statistical probability, it, it turned out that six or seven of them were those kind of slow-paced, dead pants. Like who? Well, the first stand-up I ever saw, apart from when I was a little kid and would see things with my mum, like the two Ronnies and stuff, like old vaudeville sort of stuff, was. Um, in, in the immediate sort of post-punk era in Britain, we had, we had this alternative comedy boom. I don't think you really had the same thing in the States. There was no need for it because there'd always been a wide variety of stand-up. You had a Lenny Bruce, but you also had mainstream guys as well. But and no one knew him. I, I didn't yeah. know him. And as much as he gets you know, bandied about you know, in terms of... You, you really, as someone our age, okay. I'm, I think I'm a little older than you, yeah. you you've got to put him into context. Well, to, me, it's meaningless. to me, it looks like there was 
a tradition of stand-up sure. in the States. Right. There, what really wasn't that right. here. There was, there was guys in like working men's clubs all doing the same gags. Oh, okay, other. right, right, like vaudeville almost. Yeah, and yeah. then you had like odd little things like raconteurs or sort of folk singers like Billy Connolly who did bits between the songs and eventually the bits between the songs became... Oh, so you but had no real stand-up. didn't really have right. it in the same way. You had occasional blips like Dave Allen from Ireland who's very like... Uh, you know, an uh, American stand-up in lots of ways. But so in about 79, 80, it sort of started here, stand-up in a way that you'd, you'd recognise. And outside of London, where there was about three clubs, the places you used to see these people was opening for, for bands. And, and I saw this guy, Peter Richardson, who went into the comic strip opening for Dex's Midnight Runners in 1982 in Birmingham, doing a character of a Mexican bandit who just spoke really in a really slow, threatening yeah. way. <laughs> then I saw Phil Jupiter, who's, who's very different. I saw him opening for Billy Bragg. He's a much livelier bouncy. I've met him, yeah. yeah. But the one that really got me was a guy called Ted Chippington, who op opening for The Fall, who were uh, the best band in Britain and are still going. And um, Ted Chippington, I don't know where he'd really come from. He... he uh, he wore like a tight sort of Teddy Boy 50s rock and roll suit. He had shaved all his hair off. He looked very menacing. And he basically told, he told the same joke over and over again for about half an hour with, with a, n a noun changed each time. Yeah. Whilst drinking from a bottle in a really slow way. And he seemed to, have, didn't seem to care whether the audience liked it or not. And I've subsequently found out he preferred going down badly to well. But I thought that was absolutely... Just, it was fantastic. That was my sort of moment where people older than me who were in bands went, oh, I saw the Sex Pistols and there was only 12 people there and I realised you didn't have to be able to play, you didn't have to be able to write a song. When I saw Ted Chippen, I thought, it doesn't have to be funny, you don't have to talk about anything, you don't have to look as if you're enjoying it, you don't even have to go quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then when I was a student in 87, yeah. three years later in Edinburgh, yeah. I went yeah. out with a student show and I saw a bill that was Norman Lovett He's very, he's about 60 now, very slow, deadpan. Arnold Brown, who's about 75 now, he was a bit like, uh, uh, he's, he's an old Scottish guy, who again was very slow and dry and deadpan. I can't remember any of his punchlines, but I remember the sort of setup, so things like, uh, I walked into a branch of Our Price, uh, the record store, as I have every right so to do. <laughs> things like that, they'll be full of these <laughs> unnecessary bits yeah, of detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's them two, and then, Arthur Smith and Jerry Sadovitz were on the same bill. They weren't the same. But just it was just a lot of the early people I saw was was slow and weird. And I sort of thought that's I could have I thought I could do that. But if if I if I'd seen all the upbeat, fast, happy guys talking about sports and girls, I probably wouldn't wouldn't be here now. It. Yeah, I was just you know I was just lucky that I saw all the odd, monotonous people, and I was quite an odd, monotonous child. And I think it sort of looked to me like something I could do. Well, it's interesting to me that, that you, the reason you saw them and the reason they existed was because the comedy business did not exist here. Yeah. And that these guys had to be pioneers or freaks to, to, yeah. to just, or, or oddballs, I don't mean to say freaks yeah, in a negative yeah. way, to take the position. And it seems to me that because Britain is, is the way it is, that there's an intimacy to the business and to the power of somebody making an impact. Yeah. That, yeah. like, you know, you live in a country where, where reviews make a difference, you know, for stand-up shows. That's unbelievable yeah, to me. Yeah, although, again, that's sort of only, it, it's in about the last 10 years, right? In, in 20 years ago, when I started, um, in the Edinburgh Fringe, uh, when there's loads of comics on all August in Scotland, you know, the, the cookery critic would be someone who go, oh, can you go and review some comedy, you know? It would yeah. be like really, but when, then about 10 years ago, they started to realise that not all comics were the same and that we do different things. And now there is... There is a sort of school of criticism for comedy, but it's a symbiotic thing because here, something that's happened here that I'm not sure if it's happened in the States in the same way is there's loads of comics doing loads of clubs, doing 20-minute yeah. sets. Right. Then there's also this kind of viable mid-range circuit where every year you go back to the arts centre in the little provincial town with a new hour and 20 minutes and maybe with an opening act and the show's got a different title to last year's and you're kind of expected to, to turn it over. You know, you kind of build up a body of work. And there's probably a couple of probably a hundred of odd people doing that, you know, so there's this, then there's a really famous people that now can do Wembley Stadium, you know, right. but, but it, I don't know if there's quite the same, there's this weird little mini circuit. Well, that's starting you know? to happen actually yeah. in the States behind you, yeah. because what we had was a, a comedy club boom, which, uh, you know, created a lot of monsters, yeah. uh, cre created a lot of mediocrity, created a lot of, of hacks who were able to work. And now what's happening is because of the internet and because of uh, exposure that people have a little more control over, they yeah. can build their own audiences. Well, I mean, the internet's been... The internet in that way changed my life. And I really... I feel like... 
some old guy going, oh, there's this thing, the internet. Yeah. And you can go on it and there's, <laughs> it's mainly pornography, but there's other but stuff. Occasionally <laughs> there's funny things. <laughs> but I mean, it is, you know, I gave up for four years and one of the reasons, when I started again, I realized You quit that, for four years? Yeah, I quit stand-up, yeah, from 2000 to 2004, yeah. What, how, well, how the hell do you do that? Well, I just... What do you do in that time? Well, I, I, I didn't really do anything for a year. I wrote music reviews for Why'd a Why did you quit? Paper. Because, um, because I was getting, I was getting really bad reviews all the time. I, I was with an agency that couldn't seem to sort of work out how to tour me or place me. I'd be keep going to clubs around the country where I'd go down really badly. Why do you think you went down badly? Because, I mean, you're a guy who has control of the craft, and despite the fact that whether they know you or not, you, you didn't... Was well, it I you think or I'd them? been doing the same... I think it was a mixture of things of, of, like... We had a comedy boom, right, you know, and that meant people started going to clubs for a night out, you know, and to have chicken in a basket and then a disco afterwards, and I'm not a night out. You know, I'm yeah, I, I know that feeling. Back, you know, I'm definitely. And I need, I need people to come because they want to see the comedy, rather than as a kind of as, as a yeah. kind of entree to. I guess we'll go if we can dance later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> you, but you know, to know that you're not that guy is a tremendous self realization. Yeah, I realized I wasn't that guy, and that, but I didn't know what to do about it. And then right. in, the, in the four years I had off, I, I realized that there was there That's was a long time. Yeah, I realized there was like my space, and there was there were there was. Also, this other thing happened where between about 2000 and 2004, between me quitting and coming back, people had started setting up little, lots of little gigs around London that explicitly weren't a night out. Not mainstream you know, comedy yeah. rooms. And they'd give them intimidating names like Book Club or whatever. Yeah, yeah, know, like, would, yeah. Almost Smart like, People's Room. Yeah, almost like designed <laughs> to not, you know, like... <laughs> to alienate idiots. <laughs> to alienate idiots, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh -huh. and, I, and it, rather than being tolerated at these I found that I was welcomed by the people that were booking them who remembered me from doing like weird culty things when they were teenagers some of them you know and and so, so suddenly the people that had liked me but were in a position of power could suddenly book me or write about me and you know it's it just sort of turned around also in the four years I had off two other things happened which was one I ended up inadvertently becoming sort of well known for something else I got I got asked by a composer that I'd worked with to um co-write the words for an opera about Jerry Springer yeah right? I read I read um, about this I wish yeah. I'd seen it and that yeah. became that got a lot of good reviews and I think what that meant was then when I did stand up again people had to kind of go well he must be doing this for a reason as he's co-written a theatrical hit so there must be he must be doing this boring stand up like knowingly <laughs> he must be on purpose rather than a mistake the other thing that happened was Ricky Gervais became famous and Ricky Gervais always cited me and Sean Locke, who's another British stand-up, as, as his favourite acts. And he was so famous by the time I started doing stand-up again that I said to him, can you give me a quote for a poster? And he did. Said Stuart Lee is the most cliche-free comedian in Britain or something. And suddenly I sold out an Edinburgh run in five minutes and then a Soho theatre run off the back of that. So it was honestly, I think it was largely down to his patronage and also um, to, uh, to having been involved in this opera, which meant that different kinds of people started coming to see me, the the theatre people or broadsheet newspaper readers, or you know what I mean? Yeah. Off the back of that. So, and, and then the internet. The internet meant I could sort of, I could headhunt my own audience. <laughs> right, sort of, sure. I could sort of um, also, con contact them. It totally changed everything. It, but that, so most of your TV exposure, I mean, out, when, you were, when you were younger, you did a lot of radio and you were in a team for a while. Yeah, I did a, I did a series for, um, for BBC Two called Fist of Fun um, in the mid-90s with a guy called Richard Herring. I've met him. I met yeah, him in Scotland. Well, he's, Sweet the, guy. he's the, he's the, um, he's the British equivalent of you. He's right. the podcast king. He, yeah. The wizard. He, yeah. He, um, and you know, at the time that got average reviews, pretty good audience figures was not recommissioned, was never released on video. When we toured it, no one came. We used to lose money. And somehow in the interim, after it being decommissioned, we found up, found pro probably not unlike, um, uh, David Cross's Mr. Show, Mr. Yeah. Show. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I saw a pilot of that after we'd done our. I was at the pilot recording of Mr. Show in LA in like '95 or something. Yeah. After we'd done our first series, I thought, "Wow, this is really interesting. This is sort of the same, but it's here." Yeah, and and they um and I think we enjoyed a similar thing where ten years later, people are going, oh, "I used to love that." Yeah, but at they, the time, yeah, you know, nothing. And also, a lot of the people that say I used to love it are now other comics or writers or it seemed like. It connected with all those people. 
But, well, yeah, yeah, so you seem to be square one for what would be the equivalent of British new wave English comedy, new wave alternative well, part comedy. Of, part of, yeah, m- for a lot maybe, of these kids, yeah. though. Yeah, like, you know, for, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really weird like, to meet people that r- say it was you know, significant to them then. Because it right. was like, nearly 20 years ago, and at the time we didn't really have No any commercial sense. success. No, well, I think, again, I think it's that people didn't really know how to tour comedy then. It was all new. I mean, we used to go out on tours and... They go, oh, yeah, it's like rock and roll. Put them in a van, put them in hotels, spend loads of money on it, and we come back like fifteen hundred quid in debt. You know, so it was sort of um, wasn't no one quite time. knew wasn't how, ready how to yet. do it. Yeah, it wasn't ready. You could do that now. So I, yeah, oh yeah, well now because you can get your following, and you yeah, seem yeah. to be like I go online, like I feel like a like a, a stupid American in the sense that I don't have any uh, you know real awareness of the British comedy scene. Yeah. I barely have an awareness of, of a lot of what's going on yeah. in, in America comedically. Yeah. But, I mean, you're entrenched here. I mean, you've been around a while, and, and you're very respected well, yeah, but in, but in but both the, worlds. You know, the back end of it's happened really quickly. I mean, like last night I did a gig in Bridport in a yeah. cinema, 450 people. Yeah. And people are going, I can't believe you've come to Bridport. And it's it's exactly the sort of small town that I go and do 400 people in all the time. I don't know why they... There's, sort of, there's this sort of perception now, I think, because of having done a telly series and the and the, had lots of good press that I'm, you know. But I mean, th- f- f- four, five, four years ago, I wouldn't, I wasn't getting anyone. You know, it's again, it's sort of. So you'd go there, no one would come. Yeah, not. That so you're day. actually just coming into what you've earned. Yeah, on and some I, level. But I also think it will go away again. Well, of course, I think but it, it, you know. So it's sort of. I don't. I think there's a. I think there's a. I think there's a glass ceiling to being. The alternative comedian, <laughs> you know, it's a glass ceiling to anything. Yeah, I, I yeah. mean, I, but I'm what I'm like seeing after I look at y- your stuff, wh- which I I think is impressive because you know outside of it being funny and, and I and I don't laugh easily. <laughs> yeah, uh, is that there, there's a commitment to something you know higher than just you know entertaining people, and, and I don't know whether that's conscious or not. But your style is your style. Yeah, and whether it's taken a long time for people to know it, there seems to be something. That like you're the reason you quit. Yeah, is the reason why you're good. Well, I couldn't. I I I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't carry on trying to get what I did to work in the, in in those because places. it was just killing you. The, killing the heart. Me, yeah. The heartbreak of it. Yeah, you know. And but now, and I think people would look. I had, I remember a guy coming up to me after I I died somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I did all right. I made a living. There were yeah. enough places where it did work. Yeah, and just he couldn't believe that I was a comedian. He couldn't believe that I could possibly do it for a living. And I went, well, I've been doing it twelve years. And he's going, you, you must be like a teacher or something, mucking around. I was going, no, it's what. And he he wasn't angry. He just was utterly baffled by it. And I think people thought that I just didn't know how to do it, whereas in fact I'd chosen to do something else. You know? My well, mum had never seen me right until this tour, the last tour I did. She came once. Never. Tour. No, she saw me twenty just years. Just last ago. year. Yeah, doing st- live stand up. And she came to the, an early show uh, in the tour, and uh-huh. she saw the bit where I throw the whole gig and run around for 20 minutes asking people why they don't find it funny and climb up into the balconies and look having a breakdown. And she saw the 10-minute bit where nothing seems to be working. And, and afterwards, she was talking to me. She was saying, it must be very difficult to do. And I, she didn't really say anything. And I thought, oh, you think that you think that, that was a failure, right? And I couldn't, and I'd lost control of the room. Then she came to see it again on the tour, where I stage managed most of the same things. Yeah, and then thought it was really good because she realised it was a performance. Right, right, right. Rather than a man who couldn't do comedy, yeah. <laughs> doing it wrong. And I kind of think you get this. I mean, again, it's it's pretentious and self-aggrandizing for us, I think, to compare ourselves to jazz musicians. But there, not many there, people do. But the well, you know, I mean, it's it's impressive that you you know you you know about jazz enough no. but it's that kind of thing where people go they can't play it's rubbish but then if they if they should suddenly do play and show that they can then those people have to then view what sounded like mess and chaos differently because it's a result of a decision rather than an accident you know, do you, you improvise a lot though at all I, well i do i try and i try and build i try and build as much in as i can whilst at the same time hanging on to the uh story but the problem with it is like these days i'll do a month in edinburgh every year in august then i'll do two months in london i do three months on the road and by about this third month most of the possibilities that improvisation can throw up have happened and they're integrated they start to become yeah like codified like you have to kind of force them to happen you know a bit like groundhog day yeah and um so i think there's a sort of a shelf life for a show and actually at the moment i'm obliged due to avarice to tour the shows for longer than they um but then they're still sort of alive you know but do you 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 mean so you're willing to let an hour's worth of material die with the end of a show yeah i mean every time i draw a line under it and i do so with great relief this year i finished this tour in april 
I've been doing that show since August, on and off. I finished it within three days. I've forgotten it. And then, you know, I was being offered gigs for this month. Can you do the Belfast Fest or whatever? And I have to say, I haven't got an act at the moment. I'll have one by the end of August. But because moment, you don't want people who have seen you to go, well, that's old bit. Yeah, but also, I can't, I can't keep it all in my head. I don't know what's happened. But you're not bored with it. Well, I am sort of bored with it as yeah. well. Yeah, I can't, like, there's only so many times, you know, it does, it does reach a point where it's worked through, you know, and it sort of peaks. And then you try and have to maintain it. And part of my reaction against that is... One of the grindingly difficult things about Jerry Springer the Opera was I'd never worked in commercial theatre. I'd done fringe comedy and little weird fringy performance arty things. So, you know, this was at a national theatre for four months in its finished incarnation. Then we had to find a way of maintaining this thing for years in the West End and trying to get it out on tour. Why was that your responsibility? Because I was the director and um, there was no money to bring anyone else in because it was always running at a loss because of various legal issues. And so you had to, then you had to recast it, but try and hold on to the same show. And you were trying to trick 50 people into, and there was lots, we built lots of improvisation into that show. But a music theatre performer's brain is such that they're looking for certainties, you know, night after night. And in fact, big... Dance steps. Dance steps, yeah. And in fact, big, all them big Broadway shows and the West End ones, when they tour, directors get given a grid of moves, you know, of like square. It's literally like, a chessboard of exactly what will happen every night and I never had a grid and no one could understand like how had you done it you know <laughs> and I think I think killing the stand up after six months each show is partly again of I never want to be in that position again where something's happening where, where people know. are like why don't you use a grid yeah why don't you use a grid for you you know It'd be easier if you use, use a grid. grid yeah a grid of like <laughs> <laughs> moves. here yeah. are your jokes here are the boxes <laughs> yeah when you did the opera it was a it was a fringe thing it was yeah. like a, it was like a cult thing yeah and then, and then it, it got elevated it and got you elevated and yeah. you couldn't deny the, the the financial i mean it was a good opportunity yeah it was i mean you couldn't you couldn't deny it yeah did and you it, resent yeah, it though it well but in the end i did because it was it was sort of they suck the, the love out of well, it. Well, beca- it yeah, it did. I mean, it becomes one of those things where business. It becomes a business, yeah. And and uh, in the end, it was sort of it was effectively closed down by by the Christian right who took against it and kind of made it very difficult to. How did it. they get a legal case against you? I mean, well, I, because until last year, there was a bl- the blasphemy was a statute on British law. Until last year. Yeah, until about 18 months ago. So you're a guy that obviously has, after watching your material, y- y- your own issues with, with dogma and religion. <laughs> yeah. And, and so then, this, and you were actually in a medieval scenario yeah, for well, something was, that you cre- helped create. Yeah, I mean, it, is, it was amazing. What happened? Well, the, the, the plot of Jerry Springer, the opera, was the first half was like an episode of the Jerry Springer show with these strange, like, where, where he'd interview all these guests and whatever. Then he gets shot by a Ku Klux Klan bloke at the end of the first half. And then in the second half, he he wakes up in hell where he, he replays the whole thing again. But all the guests that from the first half come back as these religious figures and he's basically asked to mediate between Adam and Eve or whatever, you know, and God and Jesus and That's whatever. pretty genius. And, yeah. and, 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 and if he doesn't solve it, if he doesn't manage to make the devil friends with God again, yeah. then he's has to go to hell now how much of that was your c- creation well it was me and the composer we were looking for a we, we wanted to you know to we wanted to say something about our, everyone's kind of culpability in um in the success of, of those sorts of, and, and also about the fact that everyone sneers at what you know for want of a better word trailer trash right but the kind of emotional problems that um are, are laughed at on a jerry springer show are the same as the great plot lines of heavy literature you know and opera and opera they're incest they're family relationships that are broken down whose child is that all those kind of things uh-huh. so actually there's a dignity in them as well if you right. Them right sure but anyway the, the, the christians got hold of the fact the far it's, the, the christians on the far right once it was at the, the national theater though this yeah, was, it was fine it was there the national theater was fine right yeah when it got into the west end like they sort of found out about it and um, someone told them and they unleashed their armies on you yeah they did they got right. sixty five thousand people who'd never seen it who'd probably. never seen it to yeah. complain about a proposed trans- tv transmission of it and because the blasphemy law was still on the statute books they were able to as was another law which was pending which mm-hmm. was eventually scrapped they were able to at least threaten to use the blasphemy law which was set up now, if under, the, it was set up under Henry VIII. If you get prosecuted, are you burned? 
Well, you know, the last time it was used was 1960-something against um, a magazine called Gay Times, which had a homoerotic poem about Jesus on the cross. Um, <laughs> and uh, which actually, weirdly, has a relationship with a, with a Dark Ages religious poem called The Dream of the Rude, which is a very self-consciously homoerotic depiction of the the cross that Jesus was crucified on. So it kind of, anyway, blah, blah, blah. There's, some, so there's the, some, a lot of that homoerotic literature in the Bible. In the Old Testament, yeah. Song of Solomon know, is a little... Yeah. Anyway, they, um, they, 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 I don't know what would have happened mm-hmm. is the answer. Clearly in now, you know, you're not going to send you to prison for it. So it created a, a difficult thing. In the end, the case was thrown out of court, but they were able to, they were able to give venues and shops, venues that might have taken the show or shops that might have stopped the DVD of it, the impression that it was actionable, so it kind of finished it off. Or else, that, or that they would not shop there. Yeah, they would not shop there. Yeah, that happens in the states. Yeah, and they, a lot of the big places dropped it, and then a lot of the venues dropped it as well. So it, you know, it, and so one of the reasons for going beyond the national theatre with it was that with these shows, if you have one that was as well received as ours is, normally you get to do a franchise of it in every capital city around the world with your grid with whoever the local star is playing. The French bloke, who's a bit like Jerry Springer, would play sure. Jerry Springer in Paris. And, uh-huh. you know, Harvey Keitel was supposed to do it in New York. He did it for two nights. They were like a workshop of it, you know. And obviously, that is an income for life, you know. But actually, what happened was it wasn't really... You just couldn't... They just sort of finished it off, really, by complaining about it. And, put, you know, people had to go into hiding because the police told them there were threats against them and stuff like that. Actors? Uh, yeah, the, the producers and the, the BBC people that said they'd put it on telly. Yeah, we know. have these religious wackos in the yeah. States as well. So they, it killed the chances for the show, It too. did, really, yeah. And, but, but you know what? It was also... But actually, when I look back on it now, the bizarre thing is... I sort of don't really mind because I think it saved me from becoming, from having to live my life in the world of commercial theatre. And, and I think it threw me back on the rocks and meant that I had to come up with something else. This and is the second time you're on the rocks. The first time it was self-exile. Yeah. And, you know, it meant I had to. And, I, and when I, when I, I've just written a book about doing stand-up. And one of the points that I make is when I went back to stand-up, in 2004 it's not like when that little film about Seinfeld Seinfeld when he goes I wonder what it would be like to go and be a comedian again you know and uh, goes around and doesn't need to because he's got a house in the Hollywood Hills and Seinfeld's on rotation forever yeah you're at the end of your rope I was in my rope I was 36 nothing I'd done had worked out and um, you know I was getting to that age where it's very difficult to start anything broke well I wasn't broke but there was nothing coming in you know, right. and this show that had worked on for five years we hadn't got a royalty for the last couple of years because of all the legal stuff and it wasn't going to go anywhere you know and, 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 it, and um, it couldn't be put on anywhere and I was not you know match fit to do stand up again and I didn't really know what I was going to do you know and, and, I, and but, I, but also suddenly I realised when I, when, when I was when I quit stand up I was thinking oh, I can't get this to work why won't these why won't these people that want, want to be entertained listen to me <laughs> Yeah. And, th- and it seems so inflexible stand up I thought you have to go and do this you have to open with five minutes of strong gags you've got to do something that works on a Friday night in Liverpool okay, yeah, I deal but then when I mean. came when I went back to it yeah. I thought you know what compared to trying to organise 50 people in a piece of music theatre yeah. it's easy you can do whatever you want right? right anything you want you can do anything you want yeah. right you can you can tell a 20 minute story you can not say anything for sure. half an hour you can turn your back on them you say can, things over and over you can say the same thing you can leave the stage and do it from the back of the room yeah and it's and, and no you don't even have to clear it with anyone because it's yeah. just you yeah you can write something at 12 o'clock after a long lie-in at midday yeah and you can be doing it on stage eight hours later and it suddenly seemed more than all these other things that i dallied around in it seemed like the absolute greatest f- form of performance so you, you were know. it's sort of born again stand-up yeah i was a born again stand-up because of this other stuff and, and also Going to a pub on a Wednesday night and getting a door split of 50 quid was 50 quid a night more than I was making from a thing playing to 500 people in a in a theater. You and, know, also, so, and you can walk away from it with, walk away from and, it. and feel happy with yourself yeah, yeah. You know, if it goes well. But even if yeah. it doesn't, I had a similar realization where it's sort of like, I'm doing exactly what I want to do and I can do whatever the fuck I want. Mm. Who the hell gets to say that? Mm. You know, granted, maybe we don't make as much, much money as you yeah. want, but you really can do whatever the hell you want. You can really do whatever you want. And like, you know, every, every, I'm sure you get this in American festivals yeah. as well, but in Edinburgh, someone will put on a night and they'll go, hey, we're having a special night of comedy and it's called Outrageous Night. And you can say and whatever you want tonight. 
And I go, well, can't you just do that anyway? Right? Have you got some other set that you hold back that's like the thing you actually want to do? Because you're not being stopped. You yeah, know? the so not the idea- funny set. That's <laughs> yeah. what it is, usually. The idea of like, you know, where are these people that aren't? Yeah. Saying, well, there's nothing, there's nothing. There's nothing else in it for us. I yeah. imagine when I watch you and and I and I see stuff in myself, which is the only way I can identify yeah, with anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that there? There is. You, you are defying the audience. Yeah, up to a point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but yeah. to yeah. over a point to yeah. some degree, yeah. well. and 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 that's your gamble. And I, you know, I understand it as a yeah. comic that yeah. like you're you're going to push them mm. in, until they might break, and then your 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 card, your reveal has got to be pretty fucking good. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it isn't. I mean, I do like that. I mean, that is the that is the weird thing in the last few years of. I mean, I, I like, I, I like. I'm really happy now that I do get to play to rooms where the majority of the people have come by choice to see me. Yeah, but I also like the fact that there'll be an element where it's that it's not going it's not going to work for them, and you have to persuade them, right? And um, and it, and it becomes increasingly hard to contrive as more people know I am, and more people that like me come to see me. You know, so you 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 be in like Nottingham or somewhere, and six percent of the people have come to see you. The other forty percent have come to see some comedy, just comedy, and yeah. half of that forty percent don't like you. Yeah. Right? And um, and on the you know on the last tour I had a whole bit about this kind of theater, the comedy of cruelty about how there's this kind of thing where everyone can make fun of the handicapped and the blind now and is that right you know and people that are into that kind of thing would be really irritated that I was taking the piss out of it and then you'd have to kind of win them round but then when I and and so every night on that tour I'd have a battle against. 20% of the room at least yeah there's a bit they wouldn't like and I right. around. but then when I did at the end of a tour I did the National Theatre in London and I played to an absolute textbook audience of London Guardian reading middle class liberals and as soon as I started on this bit everyone got it immediately and applauded and went well done how refreshing to hear someone say that and there was not a single pocket of dissent in the room so consequently how did that feel? Well, it was not much fun, you know, because <laughs> because it just sort of went like smooth, and there was exactly. no, there was nothing at stake, right? You know? So I sort of like, I liked, and you resented them for liking you, didn't sort you? of, yeah. And I, you know, and I, and I missed. I was thinking, oh, what a shame there aren't some like skinheads in, like, yeah, you know. And but but on the other hand, I, I really hate wasting people's time, you know, because I'm a, I've got a three year old boy now, and like for me and my wife to go out, you know, it's a military operation. We need to get babysitters and. And and I would I I feel really bad for like people that have come in good faith to see some comedy, and have got a have got a, a babysitter if they're middle aged and got kids and have gone out and then get me and it wasn't what they wanted and that's one of the reasons when when you saw me in Edinburgh and I was doing that tent, you know I shouldn't have been in that venue in that tent because that was like where people went for a night out. You yeah, know, but but and, let me but let me ask you something yeah. in relation to that yeah. because you know you bring up your child, you bring up you know where you've been yeah. as a person and that do you not see I have to assume that even watching some of the TV vehicle, your, yeah, your yeah. most recent TV show, you know that you, you you know you like sticking it to them a little bit yeah. as I do too, challenging yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Now, but you have a big heart about it. So you actually are empathetic <laughs> yeah. with people that are not going to understand you. And well. But do you find that there was a time where you used to say, like, you don't understand me, go fuck yourself? Absolutely, and I'm really embarrassed about it, you know. And I, I and when in my 20s, well, you know, longer than that. And so as recent, you know, until sort of when I quit, I would, I would, I get a sort of stupid pleasure in the fact that half the room weren't getting it. You know, I'd be, I'd be pleased, and I'd be thinking, ah, you squares, you know. And now I just think, did you walk you know, rooms? Were you the person that was like, go ahead, leave? leave yeah Did you, you know that that's the kind of thing yeah or or, or you'd like really you'd, you'd enjoy putting them down if they started on you whereas now i try to absorb heckles like a soft target you know like last engage night, in conversation yeah, perhaps and like go look last night in bridport i was in bridport and a guy was going the guy was hating it you know and i was what did he say he was going ah oh, boring you know and then he was oh. going get on with it get on with it <laughs> oh no and i went look this is it. I said, this is how I speak. It goes at this pace. There's nothing I can do about it. This is my act. And he's going, get on with it. And I went, what you want, you want more of what you don't like, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and like, but I was, I never picked on him. I, I tried to like keep it soft, you know, right. because I don't feel it's their fault. And, I, and having sat, actually having made the television program and sat and edited three hours of myself with the editors, on this street actually further up the street for for four weeks I can understand how infuriating it would be to watch me if you didn't like me because there's nothing to get hold of the bloke was going there's no jokes you know I thought yeah he's right there aren't and he's come out in this little town in Dorset for a night out 
and he's he's stuck in this thing. He hates it, and all the people around him are really <laughs> laughing. It must be infuriating. Because you know? in order to fight the fact that he's stupid, I'm not necessarily yeah. stupid, no. but doesn't understand. Like not, it's infuriating on two levels. I don't understand why they're laughing at him, yeah. and why am I not laughing with these everybody else? Yeah. You know, oh, it's so, very lonely. Uh, but, uh, it's a lonely, uh, angry place, Stuart. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. I did go through that thing when I was young of like, I think, ah, they didn't like it, yeah. And now I, I, I try to, when I put quotes on a poster, I put three quotes on a poster, and one of them will always be, I've got many quotes from many papers that say, I've got, I've got, I'll put on the, the, the worst comedian in Britain, as funny as bubonic plague, the sun. Mm -hmm. I put that on a poster. I put... His whole tone is one of smug, patronising contempt, the Birmingham Mercury. I put that on so that people... that people It's like a warning. It's like, look, you might not like this. So if right. you want an absolute dead cert fun night out, don't come. But, yeah, <laughs> you right. Know, it's, it's, I've done my best to you stop are. them coming. <laughs> <laughs> but you are like a, a real stand-up comic. Like, And yeah. I've always felt that, that you know there's a difference between a comedian right. and a stand-up comedian. Yeah. That when I watch you, you know, I don't think alternative. I don't think anything. I just think, you know, great comedian. Like, you know, oh, Bob cool. Newhart or anybody oh, that thanks. has, you know, yeah. a tone yeah. that, and that owns their own space up there. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be an actor or, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, in yeah, this as a means this, to an end. Right, this is else. what we do. Yeah, because the, a lot of the comics I like, I love I love these guys that can write these brilliant one-liners. And even someone who was like off-beam or or had a weird style like Mitch Hedberg, in the core of that, there was loads of good jokes, yeah. right? But I also really like people where it's all about who they are and where they're coming from. And you couldn't take that line and give it to someone else. Couldn't take anything and from And you them. couldn't take that story and give it to someone right. else. You know, like, and... Um, that's well. That's one of the things I thought was great about um, Paul Provenza's film, The Aristocrats, where Paul Provenza and Pendulette Swing. Let's see. Let's see a hundred people do the same joke, and then we learn what is the essence of them and their, their right. delivery and their style and who yeah. they are. And like George Carlin does that joke with a world weariness, as if he's been crushed by the by the responsibility of telling it, which uh -huh. is sort of how he imparts truths to uh -huh. us in his act. Whereas there's other people in it that do it like, as if it's really great fun, and you know. And I kind of think there's I'm. It's quite hard to to plagiarise me because the things are too long, and they're about style as well as the words. You know, yeah, it's no, it's in, it would be impossible because so much of it is about rhythm, yeah, and so much of it is about timing, yeah, and so much of it, uh, yeah, it, it would be impossible. And you know, and that also makes me think that maybe that the sort of artistic endpoint of stand up is it's really great. People can write all these jokes, but really. A joke can be written down and retold, and maybe we should be thinking like in sort of three dimensions about what we do. It's not just about words; it's about sound, how they're delivered, rhythm, and who are you as well, and, and who's and just, saying this joke, uh, and what point of view is informing it. That's right. Know? That is the art. That's where that's where it comes into. And, it. and that's why all these discussions about taste are sort of spurious, because a, a, a bad taste joke or a supposedly bad taste joke doesn't exist in, in isolation from who's told it. And Chris Rock was very good on this. He said, as long as you're, he says it's fine if you're applying pressure upwards. And and where is up depends on where you are. If right. you're if you're a successful white guy in a smart suit that looks like it costs a lot of money, I would say your targets are limited because you're the man. Yeah. You know, you're you're uh Right. You've got to think most of the pressure you apply is downward. Right. You know, I and think it, it does make it does make a difference. But in in talking about stand up as art and also by by pointing out jokes, that's almost demeaning to that model. Yeah. That by saying that, like you know, that joke, you know, as yeah. this as this detached floating yeah. thing, yeah. doesn't matter. It, it's demeaning to being a real stand-up. When people, you know, de they say that we're just yeah. joke tellers. Yeah, yeah. They're demeaning us in a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of a lot of money is spent in publicly funded theatre workshops, where uh, you know, highly educated theatre practitioners sit around working out how to engage directly with ordinary people in an audience, how to break the fourth wall, how to take theatre into unusual spaces. And all those things are things that the worst hack comic does every night. He has to walk into a room and, and recalibrate everything around the space, who's there, what time of night it is. He has to make in-the-moment choices that um, people in theatre win like awards for doing. If they do it the slightest bit, people go, it was amazing. He turned slightly to the left instead of walking straight forward because... Something had happened in yeah, the room. Yeah, it was a choice, you know. improvisational choice in the moment. Yeah. What you know, a genius. What a genius. And yeah, we live that. A comic is making improvisational choice from the moment they enter the room. Yeah. They know they go, you can't do, that's not going to work here. They won't be able to see me there. The bar's open. The last yeah. place you did it was closed. It's like every, 
It's every courageous. Every single thing is different. Yeah. You, you know. talk about about that about courage. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, in, in that you know how people misuse that word. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. yeah. But I guess there's just different <laughs> levels. Of yeah. It. Yeah. Different but I, I like that the idea of art, you know, in, in that way, because I don't, I don't always wrap my head around it, and I, and I know that it's not so much that we have a higher purpose, but you know, what we do has got to be defined by the same standards as any other art, yeah. and certain people take it to that point, certain yeah. people don't. So now that you've established this freedom, you know, your ability to talk about uh, religion, you know, political correctness, uh, they, they, there's a couple bits I want to tell this to people because I, you know, I had not watched you, and people in in America don't know who you are, but if you look up. Stuart Lee on YouTube. There's plenty of stuff there. You have a novel out. You have a book out. Yeah. There are several DVDs out. But the stuff that, like, you actually, when I watched, uh, there were two bits, the, the Weight Watchers bit and, oh, yeah. and uh, you know, dealing with the Muslim uh, issue yeah. or and the political correctness that, you know, if you waited out, even the E.T. bit about, <laughs> about ladies die yeah. death is that in the time that you take to humanize the people that you're talking about mm -hmm. and then either use them to, to skewer what you're talking about, you still respect the people that you are creating up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even well, if they're ridiculous. Yeah. And there's a lot of heart in that. And, and, and that's what makes it different, that even if you're saying something that's going to, you know, make people feel stupid or, or the point you're making is to call someone stupid, the amount of heart you invest in characterizing it is what makes a good comedy. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, I'd not, I'd not thought of it like that, but I do, I do suppose it's, again, it's, I'm, doing, I'm trying to do a bit about the new government. Right? We've got a new conservative government here. We haven't had one for 17 years, you know, and uh, they tend to be on the right. They tend to be from very privileged backgrounds. And when I started stand-up in the 80s, the whole, every comedian and every audience hated the conservatives that was basically what the the comedy circuit was just loads of hating the conservatives yeah. and it wouldn't be like a bill you get now so i was on a bill in aspen where what one woman her shtick was that she was a black republican another guy was there I he was a her. white liberal yeah you wouldn't get that in the 80s so everyone was left of center and hated the government right and 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 i just, and when the tories came back you in, know black republicans a gimmick yeah i know yeah okay. i know it's a gimmick yeah but even so you wouldn't <laughs> okay you, know, you, yeah, wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't have got some of it so um uh so when the tories got back in i sort of thought oh, i wonder what it'd be like now to do that like really straight down the line hating the tories stuff we used to do in the 80s it doesn't wash now because society's so much more diverse you know and confused and, thought, and confused and yeah <laughs> and i thought okay how do you undermine them well the way you what you have to do is you have to be sympathetic to them as if they're privilege and the fact that they've moved through society without ever meeting any ordinary people and that they're that they're um cowed by a notion of duty towards having to support the old financial institutions is actually a terrible tragedy for them it's a make burden them, the burden yeah, yeah make them sympathetic and actually they become ridiculous but yeah actually, that's a genius to thing fight them yeah and say they're scum it's sort of you've lost it already yeah and it's a bit and you know that's what i would have done 10 years ago it's a bit like dealing with hecklers you know it's sort of funny to to sympathize with their inability to enjoy the show that's right to humanize them <laughs> yeah <laughs> Right, right. And to yeah. apologize. It must be very for difficult you've done. for you. <laughs> yeah. <That> can, <laughs> you know, like, it's so sad. You know, I do I do apologize that this is what I do and it's not it's not possible for me to change it. Yeah. Um, but that's really, that's really you know. more in line with your style. <laughs> yeah. That I think that there was yeah. a time when you were younger where your style was your style and your anger about it not being received was that. Yeah. And now you, you because of your confidence and, and the yeah. humility that you acquire just yeah. from living, yeah. you start to you know, be able to empathize. Yeah. Well, you do start to be able to empathize. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, it's, uh, but I also think giving up. And then starting again and realizing how grateful you are to be able to be a comic was really important. The other thing is, actually, when, in, in the 90s, this phrase got bandied around here by one particular journalist, Janet Street Porter, comedy is a new rock and roll. And what had happened, basically, was there was a couple of stand-ups in the early 90s who were good-looking enough to be photographed for... <laughs> The magazine in general, yeah, in yeah. general, for fiction in general, <laughs> and looked like they could have been in an indie rock band, you know. And, and you that, were one of them, no, but but I was the second wave of that, you uh -huh. know? and like, um, and and uh, you know, I was part of there was a, a whole bunch of us that you know, we we would have been in a feature about these new comics in a magazine. That, I, I was in one of those in, in the know, states, yeah, you know what I mean, and you'd be photographed in the way that someone in a band would normally yeah kind of like with the stance yeah yeah the, with the a story yeah. or something yeah i think you know. there was one in new york magazine with me louis ck sarah silverman and david tell that's exactly the sort of thing i'm talking about yeah you know where I'm from. anyway and they give you an outfit to wear yeah and yeah. i knew i was from that generation and then and then by the by the time when i gave up i was 31 or something 32 and it was sort of like 
I was getting these reviews going, oh, he used to look like Morrissey and now he's a bit puffy around the face and it doesn't really wash and his quiff's wilted and he's still dressed like an indie rock student from 1989. In the four years I had off, I put on about two stone, I don't know what that is in pounds, a lot, and I went grey. And when I came back, I was allowed to be... I was allowed to be miserable and clever. Whereas... As in, in your 20s, when you're thin and can get away with a pair of leather trousers, it looks like an affectation. You mm. know what I mean? I actually think some people in all areas of the arts and in life, they grow into the shape that suits who they are. And um, Finally. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. And, and like, or, or, they, or, they leave, or they leave it. You know, it happens to, like, you know, you maybe you, it doesn't work anymore what you're saying because you don't look right for it. Or suddenly what you're saying that never, what you were saying that never worked works because you're heavier and older and grayer and i think with me look what life has done to him yeah yeah we exactly. like him now we like him now you know <laughs> he's he's entitled to look <laughs> frank skinner said to me your act will never work he said to me in your 20s because you don't look you don't look you know to be draggled you don't you don't look you, you're too you look too healthy and young to feel like that and it was it was like an affectation you know yeah. it's like an affectation of a cynical affectation a cynical affected look at the world but, actually, but also we're just dressing the way we want to dress. I mean, yeah. like I look at even I, I imagine that if you look at yourself when you were younger, yeah. you're probably saying like, that's a ridiculous jacket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just at the time yeah, you thought yeah. it was a good decision. Yeah. Can I ask you a couple of specific comedy yeah, yeah. questions? Yeah. In watching the TV vehicle that I saw, there's a, a sketch piece uh, about a, a fictional comic called Dill Spinks. Yeah. <laughs> Now, you know, I know the, the, the level at, of which Hicks is revered here. You yeah. know, I, I knew Bill a bit back in the day. I, I certainly know about him and his material. Now, that, that was clearly based on him. Yeah, partly. I can, but go on. But, you know, yeah. my first reaction yeah. was like he's taking the piss out of Bill oh, and no, the Bill legacy. No. No but, no, but but then I started to realize that, you know, if I'm not misunderstanding yeah. it what you're taking the piss out of is the myth of bill yeah and the, and the perception of um someone like when they die they can become they can be made to support this weight of uh mythologizing and i don't think i think it's something he would have seen through immediately himself right well it uh, took you know. me a second but i did see yeah. it and he also becomes one of these people that people that don't know anything about stand-up go oh, i don't really like stand-up i like bill hicks so he's fantastic and you go well there's loads of people, you know, it just because, like, he's on the sleeve of a Tool album doesn't right. mean, like, he's the only one. You know, but the other thing, very specifically, that that was about was in 1995, uh, I, uh, Kevin Eldon, who's a comedy actor, and uh, and Ben Moore, who's a, like, he's like someone like David Sararis, he's one of these kind of blokes. Sure. Is that his guy's name? David right, Sararis, so, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. We went on a road trip in the States for a month, and we went to San Francisco where we knew... Um, uh, Harmon Leon, you know, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and he was writing Might then that became um, McSweeney's mm -hmm. after he left. And um, the guy who's in Flight of the Concords, uh, Arch, no, Arch, Arch, yeah, 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 Arch director, yeah. And um, anyway, we hung around with a lot of comics in San Francisco uh, for about a week, and there was this guy, and I forget his name, and he was always talking to Harmon and Ar Arch. He was saying, "I'm doing the Chuckle Hut tonight. You know, do you think I should do my mouse bit?" And um, they were going, oh, I don't know how it would work there. Then we'd see him the next day, and he'd go out of the mouse bit go. And he'd go, it went all right, but I'm doing so-and-so tonight. Do you think the mouse bit will work at the Laugh Factory? <laughs> and um, they were going, oh, I don't know if it would work there. And like, we never saw the mouse bit. Right. right. And what we used to do for the rest of the trip, was we would improvise in the car various different takes on different American stand-up styles doing the mouse bit. With the mouse, but you're making up. Yeah, yeah. We're making, and the one we had the most fun with was the Bill Hicks type. Yeah, yeah. Sort of angry mouse hating mice. Yeah, 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 <laughs> and yeah. um, and Kevin was particularly good at it. And so years later, that's that's sort of where that's from. Is and the other thing that is also about those cheap documentaries where they've got no footage and they have to keep going back to the same little bit over and over again and like vision mixing it differently or sure. whatever. So you know, it was sort of about that, but it was also kind of it was really about this how the dead comedian becomes a sort of uh, symbol for things that they probably would have found ridiculous in their in their own life you know yeah. and, and like how many times he, he wasn't uh, a comic a he was a preacher he was a prophet a poet no he wasn't he was a comic and actually you should be proud to be a comic rather than thinking that it's dignified by comparing yourself to a 
poet or a preacher. There's bad preachers. There's bad poets. Sure. There's we're, some pretty bad prophets. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Most you of know, them. Most of them. Right. So it's <laughs> sort of, have to be correct, it's actually they should be flattered by the comparison to. Yeah. You don't justify Bill Hicks by saying he's like something else. Right. So actually he's a fu- he's the top of the game of being stand up. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. he's not. Yeah, he's not a, he's not, and Simon Munnery's got a really funny line. You must see Simon. You know, he, he got a review saying Simon Munnery's act is the closest comedy comes to art, right? And then he drew a Venn diagram on a board. Like, it can never be art. Yeah. There's a gap, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a gap between comedy and art, and he said he's decided to give up doing uh, comedy and, and instead try and be shit art, which is really funny. Like, yeah. a, a good comedy... Never be out. It's going to be right at the bottom of it. You know, sure. It's really funny. Do you believe that? No, I don't. I think it. I think that. Um, like I said, I think. I yeah. think there's. I think the worst, the worst hacky comic that we would all sneer about behind closed doors is is making choices and doing things, in the moment, that are beyond beyond theater. That are beyond m- m- most practitioners of other areas of the art of of the arts who who, who you know largely play it safe a rock band is protected by volume and, and other guys and other guys yeah and a, and a, and a, and a theater and a Songs. theater show is protected by the yeah. decorum of the theater sure we're exposed Acts. yeah and we're made to we're made to we're commandos yeah we're art commandos <laughs> we are. Yeah. Art he's assassins. More than, you're more than a comedian you're like an assassin yeah for a that's we're going in we're <laughs> We're under cover of a facade that's uh, hiding our pain and fear, and we're here to do some damage. Yeah. This is all good stuff, and I hope yeah. people go see the, go watch the Stuart Lee uh, stuff. Uh, two things seem to have happened to you in the last five or so years that, that must have changed your heart significantly, because there is definitely a difference between your tone as a young man and yeah, your tone yeah. now. You, you had a child, yeah. and you also realized, you also found out who your real father was. The, the the bit you're talking about is I, I found the you know I looked at the paperwork and then I was able to you were do, adopted yeah I, yeah I was able but I haven't um, found out but I I, 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 I you were just I, able to decipher yeah, that you were Scottish for a bit. yeah I mean I, well I thought I was but I don't know now it was because it was <laughs> oh, no. it was Church of Scotland on the thing you know oh. so I wrote a load of stuff about that but I think actually I think it probably is something that chips away at you at the back of your mind I think an interesting thing about being adopted in the 60s in Britain was there was a degree of social engineering in it. And you, know, if you if you were adopted in the sixties in Britain, yeah, and there weren't many adoptions after um, after uh, April sixty eight because the abortion law was um, loosened up. So there's a kind of glut of people my age who uh, couldn't be gotten rid of, <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, and and I'm allowed to make that joke. Uh-huh. Uh, you, you can't be offended by that because I'm affected by it. Um, but um, it was a degree of social engineering where you were placed at the exact centre of society because mm-hmm. the ch- charities or whatever that were doing it they didn't want to make you like poor and they didn't want to make you a spoiled rich kid so you were placed at the exact centre of society and I and I sort of think there's an anonymity about it like I can't, I can't do what a lot of comics do where they go oh I'm you know I've got an Irish background therefore I'm like this and I'm not working class and I'm not I'm not like privilege i'm from the i'm statistically from the exact center of society and i don't know what my racial or ancestral heritage is and i like the neutrality of it and when i first came to london in 89 to do stand-up one of the things that comics coming to london do is they make an act that's about where they're from in britain if you're from liverpool you know you could talk like that and talk about sure. stealing cars mm-hmm. and if you were from newcastle you talk about how no one wears a shirt and it's really cold and there were all sorts of different things and i i fought off the midlands accent that i had and tried to become like nothing, and uh, and I think that's partly to do with being adopted, and partly to do with the social experiment of knowing that you are exact statistical norm. Yeah, you know, and trying to like look at things from that. Yeah, and to not fall back on being informed by anything. Yeah, know? yeah, um, that blank so, slate, tabula yeah, rasa. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and that worked for you. I think so. Yeah, and I mean, it's sort of what's weird now. My wife's just pointed this out: is that is that some of the stuff that I do has started to... I have to be a bit more careful with it because if I'm com- complaining about a particular thing, I used to be just a nobody complaining about it, but now I'm a guy who's had a TV series. And that and the perception of you is, is you are you ungrateful? Are you jealous? What are you? You know what I mean? Temper it with your humility. With, it, with the humility, yeah. So it's weird. that's a weird thing. You sort of... Finally, there's something that is attached to you, which is that... Oh, he's off the telly, you know, and though it does change you're, it, you're 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 up, you're elevated now. Yeah, 
you're elevated, which and means you're a success. Yeah, which means you don't have the same freedom. You don't to have be the same freedom off. to be pissed off. Yeah, because <laughs> you know you're one of those guys Chris Rock was talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, does it bother if, you? Oh, it does a bit. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, yeah. You just have to find a way around it. You have to make yourself seem uh, arguably more unreasonable and absurd. I think, and they kind of accept it. And weirdly, that problem is solved when you have a child because I couldn't having had a kid I couldn't I couldn't carry on with the same degree of cynicism about the world because you have to hope on some level that it will improve <laughs> well, what, you know because you've you're made to be a stakeholder in it but yeah, yeah. but also isn't there like because there are, are comics now there's a popular trend to go the other way with children oh yeah and hate it and moan about it to moan yeah, about yeah, it yeah, and, yeah. and also to continue to be bleak. Yeah. Now, right. you know, it seems to me that the real humanity of having a kid is that somehow or another you, you, you are forced as a selfish person, certainly yeah. as a comic, to be selfless and, yeah. and also, you know, to, to take that final step of maturity in taking that responsibility and, and also feeling your heart open to that experience. Yeah. Uh, whereas opposed to some people, it's like, yeah, oh, what a fucking chore. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't recommend that any comics listening with writer's block you know have a child as an attempt to solve it <laughs> but right. i do think that it's you know in as much as you don't you don't have the time to write and whatever it does mean that you you know i don't i'm not going to go on and do like uh, an hour about changing nappies and you'll figure out a way like to that. approach you know, it it does like it does change the way you look at things well i mean it seems to coincide with this uh, empathy yeah. that you uh, have 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 you have now for yeah. people that don't understand you or resent you <laughs> Well, I, I got to tell you, Stuart, it's been a pleasure getting Thanks to know you, and, uh, and uh, I appreciate you doing this. Oh, it's really great. Thanks a lot. That's it. I'd like to thank Stuart Lee and the country of Great Britain for having me. As always, go to WTFPod.com. Uh, get all your WTF Pod needs. Order a T-shirt. Donate some money. You know, buy some of those episodes at WTF Pod Shop, the live ones from comics that we've uh, we put up. And also, what else can I tell you? Get on that mailing list. Go to PunchlineMagazine.com. Go to StandUpRecords.com. Go to JustCoffee.coop. Or you'll get it all if you get on my mailing list. It'll all be in there. Updates. All kinds of things. Pictures of people. All right. Got to go. Pip, pip. Uh, it's been grand. You're all brilliant.